Okay. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about Article 10. Um, starts like this. L'ordine amendo giuridico italiano si conforma alla norma del diritto internazionale generalmente riconosciuta. So, this is uh, a complete change from the fascist period where the fascist considered the Italian uh, judicial system as being completely sovereign and without limits. Um, there is a debate in uh, modern times between sovereignists and internationalists. And the sovereignists, <coughs> we, <coughs> we can say, stand for the sovereign state having absolute power to do whatever, uh, whereas the internationalists believe in more collaboration and cooperation and integration into an international community, uh, which is globalization. Uh, the, the sovereignists we can see as Brexit, Trump, uh, politicians from the extreme right that believe the nation state is uh, completely sovereign without limits. Um, here it's saying that the judicial system, the Italian judicial system, conforms to the international law which is generally recognised. So, Italy is a conformist. It doesn't break the international law. It uh, complies with international law. And a, a, the Constitutional Court has said if a judge is confronted with uh, an, an Italian law and an international law, the international law must be harmonised with the international law. The Italian law must be harmonised with the international law um, unless we're talking about the supreme principles. <coughs> the fundamental principles are considered supreme principles and unchangeable because uh, to change them we will be changing something fundamental about the, the Italians and you know a lot of what are in the supreme principles are universal we consider universal anyway like the fundamental rights and solidarity equality um, separation of the state and church etc uh, considered as universal uh, this article recognizes the presence of international law and the supranational nature of international law, the fact that it is over uh, national law, which the sovereignists would could uh, dispute. <coughs> do we need, this is the question, do we need international law? Um, Okay, first thing, why do we need laws? We need laws to know who is in the right and who is in the wrong. International community, you can't have a community without rules because you've got to know who's in the right and who's in the wrong. But the international community itself is very diverse. And, you know, the Chinese have their way of looking at things the English thought their way of looking at things, the Italians there, there's so much diversity and differences of world view. Uh, without rules, without rules, um, who could say which nation is behaving in a, an acceptable way and which one is behaving in an unacceptable way? We need rules in any community to establish these codes of behaviour. But also we need to, to, you know, show in a community what, how to behave and what 
the rights are and obligations are of the different actors. So Italy will have rights and obligations, France will have rights and obligations. We need to establish those before uh, to discipline our behaviours so those rights and obligations are respected. <coughs> We do need in any community uh, predictability. If, you know, in, a, in the school, I see someone with their hand up, I know they want to speak and I can point to them and they know they can speak now. This predictability creates a behaviour which uh, can help us progress towards something. So that's important. And then we've got big, very important things like climate change. We need rules to deal with this. Uh, to, very important to the human survival. These global problems, also global terrorism, etc. So uh, we do need rules, international rules, and we can say these are these should be generally accepted because it's not always clear. For example, you know some countries may recognise Taiwan as being part of China, others may not. So uh, they've added this, uh, the international rules generally recognise. So uh, Italian must conform to those generally recognised. Um, and the next question, <coughs> if we must we need international rules because we want an international community. Remember, the Founding Fathers established that the community is very important in Italy and so now they are expanding into, in Article 10, they're expanding into an international community and obviously they'll value that too. And we need rules to create uh, a community. Which rules do we need to create the community. If, if these rules are to be democratic, who decides the rules of the demo, of the international community? What are the sources? Well, one source are treaties. Remember, treaties are written by sovereign states, and sovereign states can do what they like. They're sovereign, but when they write a treaty with another. Uh, sovereign state or many sovereign states they must respect these they've given their word um, and they need to respect these uh, indications of behaviour, limits to behaviour written into the treaties and these become international law so this is one very very important source of international law, anything Italy agrees with and which is approved by Italian Parliament and the, the foreign parliament, uh, other sovereign state parliaments will become uh, international law and then it can only be broken or, or, or cancelled, annulled if you like, uh, if all parties agree that it should be. You can't unilaterally uh, break these treaties without permission of the other states. Once they're made and signed and approved by the sovereign parliament, they become international law. Um, these treaties <coughs> are for, you know, they can be for anything. England's got a treaty to withdraw from the European Union on, on what it must do to withdraw from the European Union. You have free trade treaties, you've got Iran that signed the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty of Me Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is why it got sanctioned, because it signed the treaty uh, with other states, so it became international law. You've got the Climate um, Paris Treaty, which Established, level, established levels that um, all countries who are members of this treaty uh, must respect 
in terms of uh, climate, you know, change uh, emissions, levels of emissions and, and uh, conversions to renewable energy, etc., establishes a process of, of reducing uh, the pollution. Then you've got treaties which establish, for example, the European Union was built on treaties. The Parliament of the European Union was established by treaties. Even the UN was established by the treaty, like, for example, the, the UN Charter, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, was established by GATT, uh, the treaty of, for membership of that. Um, all Geneva Conventions, all these treaties have created international law and um, Italy must respect them. But there are other sources of international law. For example, uh, traditions. If a country does something like fish in a certain water for many years, it's not challenged, it's not confronted, um, it becomes international law uh, because that becomes part of the tradition and the culture. Culture is made of traditions. So if, if the country is doing it over many years, it becomes part of the culture of that country and that becomes international law, uh, which is why many countries are racing to the Antarctic, which is melting, and trying to establish a presence there so they can look for oil because they know if they, they do establish a presence there and they're unchallenged after some time, it belongs to them. Uh, there are other sources of law, for example, the International Court of Justice. Uh, the, the sentences of the International Court of Justice is jurisprudence for international law. If they make a pronouncement, that becomes international law. Or maybe pronouncements by the European Union or, or ONU or UN, these supranational bodies can become international law too. Uh, <coughs> now, um, does Britain also does British constitute? Does the British Constitution also have such respect for uh, international law? Yes, our Constitution, the, U, U, the British Constitution, is seen as being very internationalist. The Supreme Court recognises this as a principle of our Constitution. But saying that, it wouldn't be so difficult for uh, the the British Parliament to break international law. Uh, here in Italy, you have the Constitutional Court that is above the Parliament. Any law made in the Parliament can be brought in, in, to the attention of the Constitutional Court and ruled uh, as unconstitutional and, and abrogated and nulled um, from the uh, judicial system that we even if the Supreme Court did say this goes against uh, international law the, the British Parliament could still uh, insist remember there's no judicial oversight on the British Parliament one of the most fundamental principles of the British Parliament is that is sovereign and it can do what it likes and so um, it would be more e it would be easier for the the, the 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 British Parliament to break international law, much uh, and and impossible for the Italian Parliament to break international law, um, according to the supreme principles in the Constitution. There is an example of the British Parliament breaking international law very recently with Brexit. They, they did start a process of a bill, and a bill was, was going through Parliament, the internal 
um, Internal Market Act in 2020 was going through Parliament that was going to break the, the withdrawal agreement made with the European Union. Uh, and so it was going to break international law, but it didn't actually reach that objective because that it was changed uh, under a negotiation between the European Union and Great Britain, and so that it didn't break international law. But there, there is another uh, proposal to break international law to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, again, uh, agreed with the European Union in the Withdrawal Treaty, and um, the British want to delay the, the, the tariffs or the obstacles to trade uh, for Northern Ireland and European Union, the European Commission has said that is breaking international law. So <coughs> even if this would be criticised and opposed and judged against by the Supreme Court, there is no judicial oversight or on the uh, British Parliament and so uh, it is possible for the British Parliament to break international law. That's, that's, that's I would say, the difference uh, for, between the, the constitutions. Uh, we, part of this, this article, or a side to this article, is to recognise not just a, a community, but to conform to that community, not to be a rogue state and act outside the community, act, uh, act outside the rules of the community, which is <coughs> also to protect peace. We're going to remember, without law, we have war. So uh, these rules of our art, so we know who's in the right, who's in the wrong, how to behave, what our obligations are, what our rights are, in a world of diversity where we don't respect rules like these, uh, they will be resolved, how to behave will be resolved with who has the biggest guns. So part of this is to preserve world peace. Um, we we, we recognise in a community you do need rules and that does preserve peace, uh, this recognition of rules, because then, you know, it's not, we don't do, uh, you know, we don't think, we have differences of opinion, but we don't want to force uh, the resolution of, of who's right and who's wrong to be done by force, where bombs and guns are used. The second comma is la condizione giuridica dello straniero è regolata dalla legge in conformità delle norme e dei trattati internazionali. Here we're talking about immigrants and their Immigrants, the conditions for immigrants are, are regulated and, and established by the law which respects uh, the international treaties and, and, and norms. So the ordinary law. We don't want officials in the public administration or maybe uh, regional level politicians deciding what to do uh, with immigrants from Somalia or Syria or wherever they come from, they can't make the rules of where they go and what they do and what they can't do. It must be established on an ordinary law level at which respects international law. And this is obviously the founding fathers during this time um, were recognising that foreigners weren't treated very well and they must be treated uh, very well. So <clears throat> the prejudices, maybe the prejudgments we might have for people of a different culture, 
must be must must not be present and things must be discussed openly and transparently and at a very high level and not left to decisions by people who maybe don't have the experience and understanding of foreign cultures and maybe are just um, not looking at things in, in, a, in, a, in a fair way uh, from from the perspective of the foreigners. Then he continues, Lo straniero al quale si impedito nel suo paese l'effettivo esercizio della libertà democratica garantite dalla Costituzione italiana aderisce sillo nel territorio della Repubblica secondo le condizioni stabilite dalla legge. So here we're saying that those immigrants that come from places that don't have the same freedoms guaranteed by our constitution have the right to asylum, can stay here. Um, and this is recognizing the universality of these, these democratic guarantees democratic freedoms which is guaranteed by the constitution not only recognizing that they are universal but also saying we will play our part to make sure that they are universal and if someone's not being respected someone comes from Russia uh, because he's he's not allowed to vote um, he can take refuge in Italy uh, because these rights are universal and we will play our part to ensure that um, they're, they're respected as universal and that people don't have to live under um, conditions where they're not given democratic freedoms. So this is quite a, an idealistic uh, part of the article which says we open our arms to people which don't have respect these universal democratic freedoms. Um, and it can, yes, and, and then it continues in the last comma, non è ammessa, non è ammessa l'estradizione dello straniero per reati politici. So we cannot send back foreigners, immigrants, that have committed political crimes. Remember, political crimes basically are people who have exercised their fundamental freedoms, political freedoms like uh, voting or protesting or criticising the government or doing, you know, political activities that would be considered normal political freedoms here. So again, this, this is to protect the universality of these freedoms and, and make sure we play our role as enforcing their universality. 